Uh, welcome to the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Researchers webinar on sarcoidosis of the spine. I'm Indy Buchanan, Director of Patient Programs with FSR. I'd like to thank our sarcoidosis awareness uh, sponsor, um, and I'm going to share their logo, um, Ballincroft Pharmaceuticals, for making this uh, webinar possible and all of our uh, educational content possible throughout the April Awareness Month. Um, make sure I stop my sharing my screen there. Okay, good. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, so I also want to go over some uh, format rules. We have a lot of folks on webinar this afternoon. Um, please note that the chat function has been turned off um, between participants, but you can chat directly to myself. Um, if you need to, if you're having technical difficulties. However, please put your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom or top of your screen, depending on what system you're using. Um, go ahead and add your questions throughout the webinar. We will be having Q&A at the end of the webinar, however. So um, don't expect your questions to be answered in the middle. Um, we'll be answering them at the end. As a reminder, experts are not able to give direct medical advice, so please make your questions as broad as possible, and please limit your questions to those related to sarcoidosis of the spine or neurosarcoidosis, um, or in response to information presented during the session itself. If you are having te technical difficulty, please chat me directly, and I will try to do what I can to help. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our expert for this session, Dr. Owen Flanagan. Dr. Flanagan is a professor of neurology and consultant in the Departments of Neurology and Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Dr. Flanagan did a medical residency in Ireland and then completed neurology residency fellowships in neuroimmunology and a master's in clinical and translational science at Mayo Clinic. Dr. Flanagan works in the autoimmune neurology and multiple sclerosis clinics at, at and the Neuroimmunology Laboratory at Mayo Clinic. His clinical expertise and research focus includes neurosarcoidosis. Welcome, Dr. Flanagan. Thanks very much, and thanks to the Foundation for the opportunity to talk today. Um, I will try and uh, share my screen here. Um, great, and hopefully we can see that. Um, so, um, the title of my talk today is Neurosarcoidosis, Focus on Sarcoidosis of the Spine. Um, and these are my disclosures, which aren't really too relevant to um, uh, this talk, as um, we don't really have any proven treatments for spinal uh, or neurosarcoidosis right now. So the outline of my talk today will focus in on some of the symptoms that um, many of you may have noted who did develop uh, spinal cord sarcoidosis and focus in on some of the examination findings that the neurologist looks for when, when they see you. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the investigations that are used to diagnose uh, neurosarcoidosis and sarcoidosis of the spine in particular. We'll focus in a little bit on the diagnostic criteria for neurosarcoidosis and I'll give some case examples. And then uh, we'll discuss a little bit about treatment and outcome. And then we'll open it up uh, for, for a question and answer session. So uh, you might ask how frequent is neurosarcoidosis and uh, the incidence is quite, it's still a rare disease. Uh, the incidence is about one per 100,000, but um, it does seem to be more common in African-Americans. So that uh, group of people seem particularly predisposed, but it can also happen in other ethnicities. The average age of, at onset is age 40 to 55, so older people, but any age really can get it. And I would say in my clinic, this is a common uh, neurologic diagnosis, and it's often underdiagnosed and underrecognized. So this is something that I see, you know, every week in my clinic, uh, particularly spinal cord sarcoidosis. And I think it's often underrecognized, which many of you may realize that it takes a long time for the uh, clinician to get to the diagnosis. There can be a genetic link with sarcoidosis. So we have seen on occasion some patients with familial cases. I think that would account for probably less than 5% of cases, but it can occur. So we usually ask about any family history of sarcoidosis because um, uh, it can run in families. Now, um, as many of you will know, uh, the terminology for spinal cord disease is kind of complicated. And I'm just going to uh, introduce some terms here today, just so you're aware, because you'll have heard these terms when people are talking about the diagnosis. So the, the Latin word myel, M-Y-E-L, means spinal cord. 
and um, uh, itis, uh, I-T-I-S, means inflammation. So if you have tonsillitis, you have inflammation of your tonsils, dermatitis, inflammation of your skin. So the term myelitis is often used to describe inflammation within the spinal cord. Pathy is a word to, to mean disease. Uh, it's, it's a Latin word to mean disease. So sometimes people will use the term myelopathy, which means disease of the spinal cord. Uh, transverse means uh, cross section. So, um, so you'll see these terms here, myelopathy, meaning disease of the spinal cord, myelitis, meaning inflammation of the spinal cord, transverse myelitis, meaning inflammation across the spinal cord. So many patients with spinal cord sarcoidosis, but if they have not figured out that the patient has sarcoidosis, they're initially diagnosed with some of these terms like transverse myelitis, or sometimes people are given a diagnosis of neuromyelitis optica which is associated with a different antibody to acroporin-4, and it's a, it's a slightly different disease. But some patients are misdiagnosed and will have heard this term uh, uh, assigned to their diagnosis before they figured out it was spinal cord sarcoidosis. So if we think about the spinal cord, here's an example. The spinal cord runs from your neck, uh, as we can see here. This is the, called the cervical spine. And then uh, you have the spinal cord here, uh, this is the cervical spinal cord in your neck. And then you go down to your mid spine here, which is your thoracic spinal cord. And then there's a lumbar uh, enlargement. And then what you'll see here is you have nerve roots uh, coming out from the spinal cord that go to supply the strength to your arms and legs or bring the sensation from your arms and from your legs or from your trunk. So spinal uh, sarcoidosis is interesting in that it can involve the spinal cord. It can also involve the covering of the spinal cord. The coverings of the brain and the spinal cord are called the meninges. And many of you may recognize that um, the term meningitis, which we sometimes use for a serious uh, bacterial infection of the meninges, but actually sarcoidosis can cause inflammation of the coverings of the spinal cord and the brain that we term meningitis. And it's more of a chronic condition that develops over many uh, weeks or months. Um, uh, and sarcoidosis can also involve the nerve roots. So sometimes you can have involvement, particularly the lower nerve roots here, which we call the cauda equina. These nerve roots uh, are called the cauda equina because they're kind of like a horse's tail. And some patients, uh, I'll show a case later, can have involvement of the spine, spinal nerve roots. So that can sometimes happen. Uh, um, so there are two groups of patients with sarcoidosis involving the spine that I think about. And the major ones that I see are patients who begin with neurologic symptoms related to the spine. So they have no prior history of sarcoidosis and they come in with symptoms related to the spine and we later figure out that that is spinal cord sarcoidosis. And that's the most common and many of those cases are misdiagnosed because nobody knew they had sarcoid before. Other times it can start with symptoms in other locations. So patients can present with pulmonary symptoms. They might have a cough, shortness of breath, particularly uh, uh, symptoms involving the lung. And then they may develop neurologic involvement either at the same time or at a later stage. And here we can see some of the examples of other regions of sarcoidosis. This is in the uh, uh, bronchoscopy. You can see these little nodules uh, coming out into the trachea here that are consistent with areas of granulomas of sarcoidosis. Uh, sarcoidosis can involve the ear. Sometimes it can involve the hands. You'll see here uh, some swelling of the fingers, what we call dactylitis or swelling of the fingers. We can also have involvement of the nose. We can see some uh, nose involvement here. Sometimes that's called lupus perneo. Um, we can have involvement of uh, the joints. Um, we can also have involvement, as we can see here, of the fingers, of the skin, and of the nervous system. So sarcoidosis can involve many different regions. And we often use, as I'll talk about later, a biopsy to find the, uh, uh, to make the diagnosis. So sometimes that can be a biopsy of the skin, but mostly it's going to be a biopsy of the lungs and we'll focus in on that later. But just remember, and many, in my experience at least, these patients can present initially with just their neurologic symptoms. So what are the symptoms of spinal cord disease? Well, patients uh, who have spinal cord disease, if you think about it, the spinal cord starts from your neck and works all the way down. So in that situation, you can have symptoms in your arms or legs or anything kind of below your neck. So these patients can have 
uh, numbness in their arms and legs, and that's a pretty common feature. So they may have loss of sensation where they can't feel hot and cold or just feels numb. They may have a pins and needles or tingling, burning-like sensation, and that can be quite painful for patients. And I will say that Unfortunately, some of those symptoms can persist over time. So even with treatment, patients can be left over with some burning, tingling, or numbness. Uh, patients can have imbalance. The spinal cord, uh, some of your, uh, the fibers that travel through there control your balance. So patients will notice if they close their eyes in the shower, for example, they might get off balance or in the dark, they might uh, notice they're off balance. And they can get weakness in the arms or legs. So um, if they have involvement of some of the motor tracts in the spinal cord, that can lead to paralysis or weakness of the arms and legs. And uh, your spinal cord also controls your urination. So some patients can have either difficulty emptying their bladder, where they have to have a catheter placed sometimes, or other times they can have urine incontinence where they lose control of their bladder. And then stool difficulties also, patients can have stool incontinence or constipation is pretty common uh, with patients. So these are some of the symptoms. One of the keys, uh, and this is uh, particularly for uh, physicians to recognize, is that the speed of onset is very important to determine what the exact cause of the spinal cord problem is. And what we recognize is that if you have a very fast onset of symptoms, that usually is most consistent with a spinal cord infarct. But the spinal cord sarcoidosis tends to come on over days to weeks to even a few months. So neurosarcoidosis will fall in here where these symptoms can come on over this time period. And at the same time, as you have spinal cord involvement, you can have involvement of other regions of the nervous system. And there may be patients here uh, on the call who have only uh, involvement in other neurologic uh, areas. And uh, the symptoms of that can include headaches. So here you can see an example of some meningeal. Again, the meninges are the covering of the brain. So you can see some meningeal inflammation here, and that can be quite painful because the meninges have a lot of pain fibers. And patients can also present with neck stiffness from that and dislike of the light. So patients don't like to be uh, like the bright light when they have this meningitis or the coverings of the nerve involved. Sometimes they can have involvement of the facial nerve, so the face can be droopy, that's a common feature. Sometimes they can have hearing loss or vertigo from involvement of the ear, um, of the, the nerves to the ear. Other times they can have involvement of the optic nerve where they have vision loss, or they can have double vision from involvement of some of the other, what we call cranial nerves. Or patients can have confusion and seizures from involvement of just other parts of the brain. When the nerves are involved, uh, you can have what's called a neuropathy, which is um, uh, just means disease of the nerve. And you can also have uh, um, sarcoidosis involving the muscle, which we term a myopathy. So the spinal cord is going to be your myelopathy and then neuropathy and myopathy. And all of these can occur in conjunction with each other. And these symptoms can lead to numbness, weakness, or even loss of muscle bulk. Patients will complain that they've lost a lot of their, um, their muscle strength and their muscles uh, 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 their bulk of their muscles has gone down. So what do us neurologists, when you come into the room, we do an examination. What do we look for on that examination? Well, oftentimes we'll walk the patient. So we'll have the patient, uh, you know, walk in the office and we'll get them to maybe uh, walk heel after toe, like the police make people walk to see what their balance is like. Uh, we can test their muscle tone to see if that's uh, if their muscles are too stiff, which can be a feature of spinal cord sarcoidosis. We'll usually measure the strength. Um, neurologists um, carry this bag around that may look familiar to many of you. And inside this bag, we have many tools that we use to uh, help us with the diagnosis. Now, my patients don't like this one because this tests the pinprick sensation. So it's a pin. So um, often uh, uh, patients don't like this one so much. Otherwise, if, if patients don't wish us to use that, we can sometimes use heat to test hot and cold. We use cotton wool to test for light touch sensation. We'll often use what's called a tuning fork here to test your vibration sensation. These are all fibers that run through the spinal cord. And then we have a reflex hammer where we'll test your reflexes. So patients with sarcoidosis tend to, uh, of the spine tend to have brisker reflexes. So the reflexes are not proactive. Sometimes they, the legs will kick out very quickly. Sometimes they can kick the neurologist and we've learned to always hold our hand out in front of the reflexes. And then also we, um, 
tend to like to scratch the bottom of your foot, which is kind of an uncomfortable like examination procedure, but it's helpful. We can sometimes use a key to do that to uh, see if there's spinal cord involvement. So there is method in our madness. I know you don't like us coming at you with these tools and particularly the pin uh, sensation, but some of this can actually help us figure out where the problem is and gives us some good indication of what's happening. So I'm sure many of you have seen us with these tools and this is kind of the, the neurology toolbox to look for spinal cord issues. So what about how do we diagnose patients? So we, we do our history. Uh, we ask you about, you know, when did your symptoms come on? How have they progressed? What are your symptoms? And then we do the neurologic examination and we think there might be a spinal cord uh, problem. So at that point, we can sometimes do some blood tests if we're suspicious for sarcoidosis. There's a test called the angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE level that we can measure in the blood. I will say that for neurosarcoidosis, this is not a very good test. We sometimes see this positive in people who don't have spinal cord sarcoidosis, and in most patients, it's not positive anyway. We can also measure the calcium level. Sometimes in patients with sarcoidosis, their calcium level can go up, and that can cause other symptoms, so we usually like to check that. We also look for other markers of inflammation in the blood, so there's something called a sedimentation rate and a CRP that are markers of general markers of inflammation. They go up if you have an infection, but because sarcoidosis is somewhat of an inflammatory disease, we can sometimes see that. We sometimes will check your immunoglobulins. So this is your antibody levels, because sometimes some patients can have sarcoidosis when they have coexisting what we call immunodeficiency. So people are born without certain antibodies or they have low levels of antibodies. And some of those patients are at higher risk of developing sarcoidosis. So sometimes we can check that. There's one called common variable immunodeficiency or CVID that we check for. And then we often do blood tests to rule out other conditions. I mentioned earlier about this neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder. We can do a blood test for aquaporin-4 antibodies. So some of you may have had that tested. We can test for something called MOG antibodies. There's another antibody that we test for called GFAP antibodies. And then we'll often test for infections because infections can kind of look similar to sarcoid. So tuberculosis, we know uh, TB can affect the lungs and also affect the spinal cord or the brain. So we usually test for TB and we can also test for certain funguses, funguses like histoplasma, um, uh, blastomycosis, coccidiomycosis and other funguses because some of those can look similar to sarcoidosis. So sometimes we'll do blood tests to test for those other conditions. Now, um, uh, when uh, patients have involvement of the spinal cord or the spinal nerve roots, we'll often do a lumbar puncture. The lumbar puncture or spinal tap, as it's uh, listed here, is a method where we put a needle in someone's back and we analyze the fluid that surrounds the spinal cord. And this is actually quite helpful to us to look for evidence of inflammation. And what I would say is that most patients with sarcoidosis have evidence of uh, inflammation, where we look at their white blood cells as you know, when you go to the doctor, if you have um, a tonsillitis or a pneumonia, they'll look at your white blood cells in your blood to see if there's evidence of an infection or evidence of inflammation. And what we see is with sarcoidosis, the white blood cells in the spinal fluid tend to be elevated. There's another marker called oligoclonal bands, which can be elevated in maybe 30 to 50% of sarcoidosis patients. They're also elevated in other things like multiple sclerosis, so that can help. We also look at the glucose. When you have inflammation of the meninges, the reabsorption of glucose can be uh, uh, affected and low glucose can be seen on the spinal fluid. We also look at the protein level. Sometimes if there's damage within the spinal cord or inflammation, we'll see a high protein. And then the angiotensin converting level has been assessed in some patients. Although there's a question about the utility of this, it's not very useful. The spinal fluid is also useful to look for other things, like we can look for infections in the spinal fluid. Is there something else that's mimicking sarcoidosis? We can also look for other immune markers. We can look for cancer cells. So there are different things that we can do in the spinal fluid. The main side effect of this as a lumbar puncture is that people can get a headache, particularly when they stand up. So sometimes we have to go back in here to their back. And what we do is we take a sample of blood from their arm, and then we put it in their back to help them if they develop a, a, a post lumbar puncture headache. And um, sometimes there can be a leak of fluid there. And what we do is we inject some of your own blood in your back to kind of clog off that leak. So some of you may have experienced um, that issue. 
Uh, uh, one thing that we look for on the spinal cord MRI, because an MRI is one of the mainstays and the main tests that we do. Sometimes we can't do an MRI in a patient who is a pacemaker, but in most patients we can do an MRI. And we look at the spinal cord and we look for the length of the lesion because that can give us an indication of what might be going on. And what we see is with sarcoid, in the, most commonly it's longer than three. So you see your vertebrae here, one, two, three, and it's usually longer than that three vertebral segments. Um, and there's other disorders like this, aquaporin-4 positive NMOSD or MOG antibodies or other conditions that can have long lesions. With multiple sclerosis, we usually see the lesions are shorter. So they're usually less than three vertebral segments. And I would say in sarcoid, probably about 70 to 80% are gonna be longer than three vertebral segments. But some patients with sarcoid can have shorter lesions. And some of those patients can be misdiagnosed with multiple sclerosis. So uh, this three um, a vertebral segment uh, level is a useful cutoff for us in, in neurology in general, and, and the sarcoid is often long. But what I will say in comparison to some of these other disorders is many patients with sarcoid, even though they've got a lot of inflammation over many of these vertebral segments, they're often doing quite well early on in the disease. So they can still walk, while with many of these other conditions, patients who have these long lesions within the spinal cord are more impaired and are unable to walk with their um, syndrome. Now, uh, we've looked at some of the MRI patterns. Uh, so this is an example of an MRI here. So what you see here is the white is gonna be the spinal fluid. And this is the spinal canal here. And this spinal cord is about the width of your finger. And you'll see the spinal cord go all the way down. We like it to be dark gray. And what you see here is it tends to be brighter or white here. And then when you give the contrast, we'll see up here that it looks normal, nice and gray up here. And then we start to see this white area coming down through the spinal cord here. And this is what we call uh, enhancement. We give something called gadolinium dye. So when you go down for your MRI, they will put an IV in and give you some dye. And the dye really lights up very commonly in sarcoidosis. And it's a useful marker both to tell us what the diagnosis may be and also to follow when we're following for treatment as we'll discuss later. In, in this case, it was interesting in that on the MRI of the spine, we're looking here at the spinal cord and we can see this white area here, but in the background of the MRI of the spine, we can see these large lymph nodes within the uh, hilar region and the carinal region that are um, uh, consistent with, um, with uh, uh, enlarged lymph nodes of sarcoidosis. So there was a clue on the MRI of the spine here that gave the, uh, the radiologist, when they see this, they might get a clue that this is going to be sarcoid and we should look closer at that chest region. Here we see another example. Here you see a long lesion within the spinal cord. So again, it's gonna extend more than three vertebral segments. And you can see this white area of abnormality. And on the axial images here, the cross-sectional images, we see it involves the center of the cord. And what we often see with sarcoid is that the lesions tend to be in the dorsal aspect in the posterior aspect of the spinal cord. So this is the back of the spinal cord and this is the front. And what we'll see here is that this uh, inflammation tends to be in the back part of the spinal cord. And this is what we call dorsal subpeal enhancement. You see another example here where you see this dorsal subpeal uh, enhancement along the spinal cord. So that posterior aspect um, is, is pretty typical. And again, this is inflammation within the spinal cord. You can see that this inflammation is going right into the middle of the spinal cord. As we mentioned earlier, sometimes you can have inflammation of the covering of the brain or the spinal cord, and this is called the meninges. And here you see an example of what that looks like, where you get this white uh, lighting up of contrast along the outside of the spinal cord, like we can see here. And we can see it here along the outside of the spinal cord. That's pretty, that's called peel or leptomeningeal enhancement, which means uh, inflammation of the covering of the spinal cord. You can see it's mostly on the outer aspect, while here it's going all the way inward into the spinal cord. There could be some uh, involvement of the covering of the nerves here, but it's mostly going inward into the spinal cord. And that predicts spinal cord, that's seen with sarcoidosis, and it favors that over some of the other diagnoses. Another example, here's another example of a patient with sarcoidosis, and we see this signal abnormality here within the spinal cord. It's very white here, and it's not looking that dark gray that we like the spinal cord to look like. And here we see this uh, active inflammation in the posterior aspect of the cord, but we also see some central canal signal abnormality. And then if we look on the axial images, we tried to highlight this as a radiological finding. You can see this 
um, three-pronged appearance here. Hopefully you can see this three-pronged appearance. And here you can see this three-pronged appearance. And we sent this to a journal actually uh, uh, to try and highlight this as a radiological finding that patients with sarcoidosis can have. And we said, this looks like a trident. And we sent it to the journal and they sent it out to have it reviewed. And then they came back to us and they said they squinted and they stared and they couldn't really see a trident. And we didn't believe that that was the case because we thought that this was pretty obvious and that this is actually a helpful finding. So what we did was we traced it around for them and we said, well, if we send you the traced figure for your readers, then would you would be willing to accept the article? And they did, they agreed that when we traced it around for them, they could see the trident sign. So this is a useful sign that can help neurologists when a patient comes in with a spinal cord disorder. If they see this trident sign, they can think sarcoidosis and get the diagnosis quicker. Because as I said earlier, many patients, the diagnosis is delayed. So this is called the trident sign and this is pretty typical of sarcoidosis along with that uh, dorsal subpeel that we mentioned earlier, this linear dorsal subpeel. Okay. And what we've also recognized and others have reported on this, a group from John Hopkins have reported on this is that sometimes we can see the uh, inflammation at the site of disc changes. So what you'll see here is that this is the thoracic spinal cord and you see some degenerative disc changes here. And then what you can see is some of the inflammation occurring at the site of those disc changes. So we wonder if uh, that arthritis at that level gives an opening for sarcoidosis to come in. Maybe there's some breakdown of what we call the blood spinal cord barrier. In the brain, we have something called the blood brain barrier, which keeps the blood separated from the brain. But if you have arthritis here, that may damage some of that blood brain, or blood spinal cord barrier, and that might allow the inflammation in. So usually it's the posterior part of the cord, but sometimes we'll see it in the, in the front of the spinal cord like we see here. And here's some more examples of these arthritis-like uh, changes uh, within the spine and then the inflammation coming right at those levels. So it's something we, we're trying to study more. Does the arthritis lead again to allowing inflammation in at that location? Now, when we um, uh, evaluate patients with sarcoidosis, we'll often do a chest, or if we're suspicious for sarcoidosis, we'll often do a chest x-ray. What you'll see here on the chest x-ray is that there's some enlarged lymph nodes here within the hyalur region, which is the region close to the um, uh, to where all the lung blood vessels and uh, the lung pipes come up to meet the trachea. So here uh, in the inner aspect of the lung here, we can see some enlargement. But a lot of times the chest x-ray is not sufficient really because it doesn't give us a good enough picture. The chest x-ray is kind of an older generation thing, but when we can do a CAT scan of the chest and sometimes we can see enlarged uh, lymph nodes in the hyalur region that um, can tell us that they're suspicious for sarcoidosis. Now that doesn't tell us the answer because there are other things like lymphoma that can do that. So we're usually careful to make sure that we go and take a sample of one of those lymph nodes to be sure. What I will say is that sometimes the CAT scan of the chest, the, the lymph nodes may not be that big and they may not be that obvious. So the, the chest CT is useful but it doesn't pick up all the cases. And what we found is sometimes the PET scan can be quite useful. The PET scan is a glucose scan. So it's a scan that assesses how much sugar your uh, lymph nodes are taking up. And what we see is uh, in your brain here, this is a, a patient here, you can see that uh, there's a lot of glucose uptake within the brain. And then what you'll see in some of these uh, lymph nodes is that there is uh, lots of uptake within the lymph nodes. So these lymph nodes are lighting up very brightly, although they were not that enlarged. So this was still consistent with sarcoidosis. Now you can see here the urine, we also pass um, uh, sugar in our urine. So you'll see the urine passing out here too, but you can see these um, uh, multiple uh, lesions here, uh, areas of uptake of sugar, uh, that sarcoidosis tends to take up a lot of sugar, that inflammation. And this was a study done. It was sent to the Mayo Clinic Proceedings, which is one of the journals uh, that we have here at the Mayo Clinic. And they highlighted that the PET scan is useful in making the diagnosis. So some of you on the call may realize that you had a, they couldn't figure out the diagnosis until you got the PET scan, and then they were able to find a nice site to biopsy. It can also help us decide, you know, we can decide which is the brightest lymph node to go after. So sometimes it's useful uh, in sarcoidosis. So I think a PET scan is useful for the diagnosis. 
So then when we, when we see the changes and we're suspicious for sarcoidosis, we'll often arrange for a biopsy. And the way we can do a biopsy is we put a camera, we put patients to sleep, and then we'll put a camera down the windpipe here, and we'll go right in here into where some of these enlarged lymph nodes are, and we can take a biopsy through the windpipes here in this region, what we call the hyla. And a lot of times that can pick up the diagnosis, and we look for a special finding that we'll talk about in a few slides ahead. The other way that you can do it is if you go in and you put a camera into this region. So say you go in somewhere here in through the neck here and put a camera in and try and get at one of the lymph nodes from the outside kind of and, and take one of those lymph nodes. Otherwise we can go through the windpipe. So there's two ways. One is a mediastinoscopy and the other is a bronchoscopy. And the lung involvement is the most common with sarcoidosis. So some patients are diagnosed with a skin biopsy, but most commonly we look in the lungs and that's our best, uh, that's our first step. And we prefer, of course, to take a little biopsy here. It's very safe to do this. There's usually no side effects associated with this and we can do it very safely. Rather than it going into the spinal cord, the spinal cord, as I said, is the size of your finger. And if somebody wants to come along and take a chunk of your spinal cord, that can be pretty problematic, right? Because it can risk paralysis below that level if they take the wrong sample. So we can do it if we really need to, but we don't like to do it as a first step. And this is an example of a biopsy where they would go in to the spinal cord and you would take a sample looking at that. And that can be important in some patients because we need to get them on the right treatment. We might be worried, is this a tumor or is this something else, some sort of unusual infection? So we want to get you on the right treatment. So we have done that effectively and safely, but it's not our first step. And it's the vast, vast minority of patients where we want to do that. And I'm sure many of you do not want surgeons going digging around your spinal cord there where there could be a higher risk of paralysis. But we have done it at times that has helped us to get patients on the right track. Now, when we look at the biopsy, we analyze, analyze for something called non-casating or non-necrotizing granulomas. And this is an example here. It's these kind of circular areas where we'll see uh, what we call multinucleated giant cells. We see epith epithelioid cells or histiocytes. We see lymphocytes around the outside. And in the center, we don't see any what we call necrosis. In some patients where we see the granulomas in the center, we'll see lots of this necrosis. We see that with tuberculosis or some other types of infections. So you can see this kind of circular region. And our pathologists are able to look under the microscope and they can look at these lymphocytes. We see mostly T lymphocytes more than B lymphocytes. And that can help achieve the diagnosis in the right setting. So we, we usually like to have a biopsy to help confirm that diagnosis. Now, what I will say is that in my experience, misdiagnosis of spinal cord circuit is quite common and there's often a delay in diagnosis. And I'll be interested in people's opinions if the, the diagnosis was delayed in them. A lot of times the patients where we can make a diagnosis quickly is if you already have lung sarcoidosis, everybody knows you have that, and then it goes to the spinal cord, then it's obvious that we know. But when it starts in the spinal cord, then that could, there's a whole range of different things that that could be, and often sarcoidosis is missed. Um, and sometimes patients are labeled with transverse myelitis, with neuromyelitis optical spectrum disorder, with multiple sclerosis. They may be told that they have a spinal cord tumor or they have a spinal infection. And uh, it's important to get the diagnosis because the earlier you get it, you can prevent, get them on the right treatment and prevent you know, long-term damage. There is diagnostic criteria for neurosarcoidosis. This is led by Dr. Stern. He led a study in JAMA Neurology in 2018. And it starts off with possible neurosarcoidosis. Now, this is a kind of a, you wanna be a little bit careful with the diagnosis of possible because there are many other things that could look like that. So. Uh, this is when the clinical presentation and the diagnosis, the, the evaluation, the testing looks like sarcoid, but we're not able to do a biopsy anywhere. So we have no pathology confirmation. And in those situations, you really want to be quite sure that you've looked very carefully uh, because there are lots of other things that can look like sarcoidosis and you don't want to miss a lymphoma or other things. So I'd say in this situation, the diagnosis, the diagnostic certainty is, is somewhat uncertain. And that might be a time when you would seek out a second opinion at an expert center to really be sure you know what you're dealing with. And so this is a time when you wanna make sure you've had a PET scan to really look and see if there is an area that you could biopsy and confirm, be more definitive about the sarcoidosis. So I'm gonna present a couple of cases. This was a 32 year old female 
who presented over the course of two weeks with numbness and weakness in the legs and imbalance, and also had some stool difficulties. There was no lung symptoms, but on examination, the patient had weakness. They had um, uh, very active reflexes. They were quite brisk or um, uh, overactive reflexes. They had loss of sensation in their legs and some imbalance. So this is a typical patient that we might see with the sarcoidosis. They had no prior medical history. This was their first presentation. And uh, at that time, uh, because we were concerned about a spinal cord problem, we did a lumbar puncture or spinal tap. And we looked and we found 10 red, uh, white blood cells, which is elevated, the normal is zero to five. And we found that the glucose was normal and the protein was fairly normal. The patient underwent a CAT scan of the chest and that was negative. So they didn't see definitive sarcoid on the CAT scan of the chest. And what you'll see here is they had this classic long sigil abnormality that we talked about earlier. And again, the inflammation was in the posterior aspect of the spinal cord. And this was a big clue to me. When I saw this, I said, this looks like sarcoid. It's coming in from the back part of the spinal cord, very bright. It looks really like sarcoid. And I said, we need to get a PET scan in this patient. And what we found was that when we did the PET scan, it lit up very brightly within this uh, within the hilum here. So these lymph nodes, while they were not super enlarged on the CAT scan of the chest, when you did the PET scan, it took up a lot of glucose and you could see that they were very bright. And we went and we did a biopsy of one of these lymph nodes through the, the bronchoscopy, the camera test, and we found these non-caseating granulomas. And then we could be sure that we were dealing with sarcoidosis. This met the criteria for what we term probable neurosarcoidosis and the patient was placed on prednisone, uh, which is a steroid for three months and a slow taper after that. And seven months later, we saw a big improvement with much less inflammation within the spinal cord. And the patient had some improvement in symptoms and certainly did not get any worse. If this inflammation got any worse, this patient was gonna be at risk of permanent paralysis in the legs and patients can be wheelchair dependent from that, which can be a problem. So the probable diagnosis of, of, of um, a neurosarcoidosis, this is the clinical presentation and diagnostic evaluation suggests neurosarcoid. Like in this case, the MRI was quite suggestive and the MRI and spinal fluid were typical in this case. Um, and we excluded many other causes. I didn't go into all of this, but in this patient, we did many other causes. And then we were able to confirm on a biopsy on pathology that there was changes that were consistent with sarcoidosis, that non-caseating granuloma. So we were pretty sure that this is sarcoidosis and this is what we call probable sarcoidosis. It's probable because we only confirmed the granulomas within the lungs. We didn't actually go into the spinal cord or the neurologic system and confirm that. And in that situation, we can be more definite. So this next case is an example of definite neurosarcoidosis. And this was a 77 year old female and she had presented with weakness and numbness in her legs and also had lightheadedness on standing, something we call orthostatic hypotension or orthostasis. And she reached her maximal over the course of a couple of months. And on examination, when we examined her, we found weakness and numbness in the legs. Um, and then she had a lumbar puncture and she had a lot of cells in her spinal fluid. The normal is zero to five and she had 220 cells, a very high protein and a low glucose this time. So we were suspicious for sarcoidosis and we did an MRI. And what we saw here was that there was some inflammation of the nerve roots at the end of the spinal cord. So this is the bottom of the spinal cord. And you can see the covering of the spinal cord is, is lighting up bright here. And then all these little nerve roots here that are what we call the cauda equina or the horse's tail, the bottom of the spinal cord are lighting up quite brightly. And this was consistent with abnormal inflammation of sarcoid involving those nerve roots. We did a CAT scan of the chest and a PET scan in her case and they were both negative. So we didn't see anywhere else we could biopsy. And as I said, we don't like to go to the nerves or to the spinal cord first, but we ended up taking a biopsy of one of these nerve roots here, and we did find, not, find non caseating granulomas. And then we could be sure that we were dealing with sarcoidosis, and this was definite neurosarcoid, and we were able to get the patient on high-dose IV steroids and oral steroids with good improvement in the symptoms, and the MRI improved over time also. So in this situation, we have the clinical and radiological features and spinal fluid that are all consistent with sarcoid. We've ruled out many other diagnoses. And then we uh, have pathology within the nervous system that are, is quite consistent with uh, neurosarcoidosis. Okay. So um, uh, sarcoidosis, in terms of how sarcoidosis occurs, we don't actually know fully. 
There's been many studies on this and the suggestion that there may be an infection that triggers in a susceptible host an immune reaction. So you have an, immu an unusual immune reaction to an infection that causes all of this inflammation within the spinal cord and elsewhere in your body. There's other suggestions that there could be other particles within the air, or you know, the, some have suggested molds or other things, organic particles, or even inorganic agents. There has been some report of increase in sarcoidosis after 9-11 and the Twin Towers falling among the people who were um, exposed to some of those substances that came out from that, from the buildings falling down. So there is some suggestion of that. And then you get an unusual immune response because you're genetic makeup makes you more prone to respond to this immune system. And then what happens is you develop these areas of inflammation, these granulomas that go through this immune reaction. And what can happen over time is this granulomas with or without treatment can sometimes get better in the lungs. So sometimes with lung sarcoidosis, we don't even need to treat with steroids. Um, or over time, the areas of inflammation can form fibrosis or scarring. And that scarring can cause lung damage or that scarring could cause nervous system damage. But we get a lot more worried. The lungs are, are a big place, but the nervous system, the spinal cord is the size of your finger. And if you get a lot of inflammation there, it's much more problematic. So we generally always treat the spinal cord disease when it happens. And um, just in terms of treatments for sarcoidosis, um, uh, we'll go over uh, the, re we recommend treatment in all neurosarcoidosis patients to prevent long-term damage. And the goal of treatment is to reduce symptoms and to prevent further damage from the inflammation. There are no proven treatments in clinical trials. So we generally base our recommendations off of our experience and experience with sarcoidosis in general. And generally the treatment is required for many months to even a few years. And some patients require it in the long term if they have relapsing disease. Steroids, I would say are the mainstay and we often use high dose IV steroids, um, one gram of IV methylprednisolone being an example to start. Sometimes we can do high dose oral steroids, which would be 1250 milligrams of oral prednisone or 25 tablets of 50 milligrams of prednisone. So we can sometimes use that. And then we'll often follow that with oral steroids um, at a high, reasonably high dose of 40 to 60 milligrams once daily for three months. Now, unfortunately, steroids have uh, are problematic. So we'll talk more later about alternative strategies, but this does seem to really work well. And then we slowly reduce the steroids over the next six to nine months and patients can improve. While taking the steroids, we often have to use an antibiotic because they lower your immune system. So we use something called Bactrim to prevent infection. And we often give calcium and vitamin D because steroids can be a bit hard on the bones and lead to osteoporosis. Steroids have a lot, a lot of side effects. So patients don't like steroids because they cause weight gain, puffiness, insomnia, they can cause confusion, they can cause diabetes, they can cause problems with the bones, including the hip bones, and they can cause high blood pressure, So and they can cause thin skin, easy bruising, lots of puffiness around the face and, and weight gain. So uh, really patients don't like them. And in patients who get a lot of steroid side effects, then sometimes we have to use alternatives. And one of the alternatives to steroids is something called infliximab or Remicade, uh, where we give infusions every four to eight weeks. Uh, but insurance approval can be a challenge with this, but it can be used in place of steroids or in patients with severe disease, we'll often use it in conjunction. So we'll use steroids and infliximab, and then we'll often use it in additional treatment. We avoid this if you have a history of TB, and there is an increased risk of infection and infusion reactions, and patients can develop an immune reaction to the drug, which makes it less useful. So you may make an immune reaction to the drug, and then the drug no longer works. And there have been studies showing infliximab being beneficial. This is Jeff Gelfand, a friend of mine uh, from UCSF who led this study um, of uh, infliximab and sarcoidosis. Um, one of the oral medications that we commonly use is called methotrexate. And we use that in, with oral or subcutaneous treatment, um, uh, which is treatment under the skin. And it's a once weekly treatment. So sometimes patients make the mistake of thinking that this is a daily treatment, but if you take it daily, you're gonna get side effects. So you need to take it once a week. And usually we give folic acid with it. And it can cause some side effects, including involving the liver, lung. It does tend to work. We need to avoid during pregnancy. And we often have to follow the blood counts over time. So it does work in the background. And a lot of times we'll use steroids with methotrexate, 
and even with infliximab also those three in combination for a period of time and then we try and wean people off the steroids and use these in the background to keep them stable for a year or two a lot of times sarcoid burns itself out after that and there have been some studies comparing different treatments and it seems like methotrexate seemed to work a bit better than mycophenolate in some of these studies and um, azathioprine is another medication that we sometimes use some of the details are here also associated with some side effects and can take some time to work and mycophenolate mofetil or celsept is another medication which um, also takes some time to work and both of these medications when you use them in the long term have some side effects including risk of uh, blood cell cancer. So you gotta be a little bit careful with using these in the long term, but they can be effective uh, initially for a year or two. There are a, a number of other medications, adalimumab, cyclophosphamide, hydroxychloroquine, rituximab, tocilizumab, tofacitinib. So many other medications that we uh, sometimes will use. It's also important to treat symptoms. So patients with spinal cord disease can get spasticity and often require stretching exercises. They can also get imbalanced. So we require a physical therapist to help with fall prevention. Patients may need a cane, a walker, a wheelchair, and they may need help with some of that. And we have medications for antispasticity. So we'll use sometimes baclofen or also termed lyaresal, or we'll use tizanidine or Xanaflex. We have medications for neuropathic pain, gabapentin or neurontin, uh, pregabalin or Lyrica, duloxetine, also termed Cymbalta, are medications that we can use. We also try to monitor the bowel regimen. We don't want patients to get too constipated, so we'll sometimes use polyethylene glycol or Miralax. And then bladder treatment, sometimes we can use medications like oxybutynin, or in some patients we need to do intermittent or permanent catheterization because the bladder is damaged from that spinal cord involvement. And then exercise is important. What you don't use, you lose. So that uh, is also important. And then we often do a follow-up MRI spine to look with the contrast, to look for any evidence of um, uh, improvement. And some patients can recur early if you withdraw the steroids too early. So if you give a patient steroids for two, three weeks and then you withdraw it, many patients will have an early recurrence. And in the long run, patients tend to improve. So here's an example, 50% were improved or in this study, 62% no longer required a gauge aid. So we do tend to get uh, improvement with the treatment, but patients can be left over with some disability, particularly if there's a delay in diagnosis. So early diagnosis and treatment is important. So finally, uh, we're just on the last few slides here. So for the future, what, what about the future? Well, I think we need to get better blood and spinal fluid tests to help diagnose neurosarcoid. We also need to analyze the spinal fluid and blood to help determine what's the mechanism of neurosarcoid and what sort of treatments we could use to target those pathways. So if we better knew its immune pathway, we could develop targeted treatments to be able to better treat it. Treat it. We need clinical trials to prove that treatments work. All of these treatments I mentioned earlier have not been proven in neurosarcoid. So if we could do a, a treatment and compare uh, patients with placebo medications, we could uh, um, better affect it. So in conclusion, uh, what we talked about today was patients can present with a variety of different symptoms, numbness and weakness in the extremities. Uh, we see the neurologist who comes in with their tools and that will help diagnose a spinal cord problem. We'll often do an MRI looking for this pattern of enhancement, the dorsal subpeal or trident sign. We'll do a spinal fluid to an analyze and look for inflammation. We'll do a CAT scan of the chest to look and see if there's enlarged lymph nodes. If we don't see that, We'll often do a PET scan looking for increased glucose uptake within the lungs that can give us a target to biopsy. We'll then often do a camera test to make that, uh, to uh, take a little sample from in here within the lungs. And then we look under the microscope for these, what we call granulomas, non-casating granulomas. And then we talked a little bit about the immune system and learning more about that and how we can target treatment. And then we talked about treatment the mainstay being corticosteroids, but other agents like infliximab looking good, methotrexate being another one that we often use, and then the symptomatic treatments like stretching exercises, neuropathic pain medications to help patients. So I think we went a few minutes over time, but just wanted to cover everything. And I will open it up now for questions and stop my share. Thank you, Dr. Flanagan. That was fantastic. And boy, that was a lot of information. So we definitely have some questions and I know that folks uh, registered with questions too. So we'll try to get to some of those as well. Um, we did send those to Dr. Flanagan in advance and you can probably notice that he added those to his talk. Um, so thank you so much. The first question we have, and this is sort of a, a take on 
some other questions we also had around whether or not um, a positive uh, small fiber neuropathy or bone sarcoidosis diagnosis makes a person at higher risk for neurosarcoidosis. I think that's a larger question that we got asked a bunch of times in the registration about does one kind of sarcoidosis suggest that you are at higher risk for specifically for neurosarcoidosis? Yeah. So, well, I, I would count a small fiber neuropathy as potentially being neurosarcoidosis, their nerves. So we, we would count that as neurosarcoidosis. Having bone sarcoidosis or having sarcoidosis in any region, patients are at risk. But if they're treated for that and they're you know stable, a lot of those patients won't ever develop neurologic sarcoidosis. So the majority of what we see, I would say, is patients who uh, present initially with the neurologic involvement. And a lot of times, the lung involvement that we find patients don't have much symptoms from or have very mild symptoms, a cough, a little bit of shortness of breath, but most of the time mild, yeah. Thank you. Um, we did have a question about diet. We get these questions a lot um, in many of our webinars. And so this question is specific. And I think it was because you mentioned the PET scan with the, with the sugar uptake. Um, so does keeping a lower sugar diet mitigate SARC symptoms? Uh, I don't think so. No, I think, you know, your body's going to regulate your sugar anyway. Uh, so it's just that uh, we use the PET scan because it helps uh, any areas of inflammation, be it an infection, a cancer, or sarcoid will light up on the PET scan. So it's useful for us for diagnosis, but not really for treatment. We don't usually use a low sugar diet or anything like that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so a big question, and, and this gets asked a lot too, can neurosarcoidosis be cured? Yeah, I would say yes. Um, unfortunately, uh, patients are often left with a little bit of symptoms from that. So it's rare where, uh, uh, where patients are completely resolved of all symptoms. But a lot of times the disease kind of, in my experience, burns itself out within a few years. So we use the steroids to try and help it improve and the other treatments that we mentioned. And then over time, it tends to burn itself out. So over a year or two, after we finish that treatment, a lot of times we don't need to put patients on long-term treatment. And the majority, I would say, in my experience, don't go on to develop a relapse. So those patients can be considered cured, but sometimes they'll have some residual uh, tingling or numbness. But, uh, you know, getting in early, getting it treated, and then many of those patients will do okay, and the disease will be gone. It will be burnt out. Yeah. So cured. Yeah. Thank you. I think um, along those lines, uh, we have a question about when you decide, like, or how you decide to stop treatment. Um, is there a criteria or a specific kind of follow-up regimen? Um, and if you are cured or it's burnt out, um, is the treatment different the next time if uh, it comes back? Um, yeah. So usually, um, yes, we, we treat, you know, as I said earlier, if we if patients, uh, if the steroids are weaned or they're stopped early, so you only have a few weeks of steroids, many patients will relapse. But in my experience, when we give them three months of reasonably high dose steroids uh, with or without the infliximab, and then we wean it down over the next six to 12 months, then patients, as we go slowly, patients don't tend to develop recurrence. Now, some patients do, but most patients will not. And then when, if the disease comes back, we'll often come back in with the steroids again. Um, uh, so, and it usually comes back at the same site. So, uh, you know, what will happen is we might wean off of all the treatment and then six months later, patients develop some more symptoms. We look and it's back at the same place it was before. It doesn't usually come back in a different location. So, and then we, we can use the same kind of treatments again. Thank you. Um, so we have a question actually about medication now. And um, one of our attendees has been on a lot of the medications you mentioned, and they're currently on Remicade, and they're wondering if that's a potential lifetime treatment. And it depends on the situation. So in some patients, they do have very uh, frequent, you know, relapses, and then we have to have them on longer term, I would say that's the minority. So uh, in some patients will, you know, use the medication for three to five years or two to five years, and then we might stop the medication completely and, and see how things go. So I think there's often an opportunity to try and stop the medication, but it depends on the scenario. If patients have had a lot of difficulty, lots of relapses, sometimes we'll use it in the longer term. These medications like infliximab have been used for Crohn's disease, rheumatoid arthritis for a very long time, and they can be used in the long term, uh, say relatively safely. Yeah. Um, and so what types of tests might be performed if an MRI cannot be done? Yeah, so if an MRI cannot be done, that can be a challenge. Um, 
um, you know, the, then we will often use the spinal fluid. We could use the PET scan because uh, sometimes the PET scan can light up within the spinal cord too, and that can be helpful. Um, uh, and we can, you know, we can still look at the lungs with a CT chest or PET scan. Um, either something called a CT myelogram, which is a, or a CT of the, the spine that you can do, but that doesn't really show us the inflammation of sarcoid. So it's not as useful for sarcoid. It's more helpful to rule other things out because if you don't have the MRI, it can be hard to know what you're dealing with. Yeah. Thank you. And so on the, the topic of MRI and lumbar puncture, actually, um, if someone's lumbar puncture and MRI were negative, um, as far back as 2018, um, should the test be repeated at, at any certain frequency when other symptoms remain, such as facial palsy and muscle pain, et cetera? Yeah, uh, you know, in the spinal cord, I would say in my experience, you know, the MRI and the spinal fluid are usually abnormal, I would say in 90 to 95%. So if everything is negative, that might give you a question, you know, for the diagnosis, are we sure that's the case? With the, with the brain involvement and some of that coverings of the nerves or the small little nerves, like the facial nerve involved, sometimes that can be harder to see on MRI. So that can be a challenge. So sometimes, um, so you just want to be sure you're dealing with the diagnosis. If you've never had active inflammation on your MRI or your spinal tap, you really want to be questioning, is this the correct um, uh, diagnosis or do I have sarcoid involving the central nervous system? Could it be something else? Thanks. So guys, we do have just four minutes left. So we're going to just rapid fire questions to Dr. Yeah. Flanagan, see how fast he can uh, answer Quick answer. Yeah. <laughs> so one question is, um, is radiation ever an effective treatment if drugs have not been effective in the past? I have not seen radiation used and in general, radiation can be kind of damaging to the nervous tissue. So I have not that, I suppose focal radiation, there are certain types of radiation, gamma knife and things that could be used, but not, generally not a, a recommended treatment. Um, so we do actually, have, we have a question about um, how small fiber neuropathy is diagnosed. So yeah, you can do a few different things. Um, uh, sometimes you can do a skin biopsy and look at the nerves to see if they're damaged. Um, you can also do uh, some things like a sweat test. We do at the Mayo Clinic where we have them sweat and people get decreased sweating with a small fiber neuropathy. And there's other tests you can do like measuring the blood pressure when you lie down and when you stand up, a tilt table test to see if the blood pressure drops because that's a pretty typical finding. So there's some of the major ones. All right. Um, so we do have a question uh, about how you might distinguish um, a, between a migraine with headache and light sensitivity and neurosarc with headache and light sensitivity. Yeah, the neurosarcoid tends to persist, you know, so with uh, with neurosarcoid, it'll go on for many days, weeks, uh, you know, many even months sometimes, while with a migraine, it usually uh, aborts itself within uh, 24 hours. But some patients can have longer standing um, involvement. And in that situation, the MRI can help you uh, distinguish if people have more of a chronic migraine, which is less common than um, some of those patients, we can use the MRI to help. Excellent. Um, and then one last question. Um, what is your position on IVIG for sarcoidosis? And um, what does it do? <laughs> as yeah, a uh, with the IVIG uh, yeah, is not as commonly used with sarcoidosis. Sometimes uh, if patients have immunodeficiency, like we mentioned, they can, that can coexist. The IVIG can boost the immune system. The way I think of IVIG is it's kind of like a, a neutralizing antibody. It neutralizes all the bad antibodies in the body. Uh, so it's more useful for diseases where there's an antibody rather than this where there's what we call a granuloma. So there's kind of a different type of inflammation here. So it's not as well proven, but if people have found it effective, it's still an option. It's a type of immunotherapy that can be used. So if it's been useful in some people, then they can continue it. Yeah. Particularly with the small fiber neuropathy, it's been useful. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And finally, I'm going to ask this final last question. Uh, um, what is the best way or when I can actually help answer this, right? FSR has an entire page on clinical trials. So if you guys are looking for getting into clinical trials, you can look there. Um, but we do have some questions around um, whether or not you know of any new medications being developed uh, for neurosarcoidosis. Uh, yeah, I, I don't, you know, I think the infliximab we use commonly and that one seems to be the most beneficial, but we've never really proven in a clinical trial. There are some others I mentioned, um, uh, tocilizumab as one, um, 
leflunamide is another one. So there's a few different ones that have been tried in pulmonary sarcoid. But I think what we need to do is uh, figure out more what, what's, what pathways are involved in the immune system and then target it that way. So I think um, more research needs to be done and, and certainly more trials need to be done. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, Dr. Flanagan, thank you so much. And thank you to everybody for coming this afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the world today. Um, we're sorry we couldn't get to all the questions. We know there are lots and lots of questions and we plan to have more webinars in the future. Um, and so I wanna thank Dr. Flanagan for his great presentation and for all of you for joining. Please also look out for your email from me. Um, I will include the link to this video as well as a link to our survey, which we hope you take uh, and share with us your feedback. And um, also Dr. Flanagan's slides as a PDF will be included in that as well. And so, I'd just like to say thank you to all the patients out there because we learn from our patients. You know, many of them have signed up for research. Uh, they tell us the story of this disease. So we learn so much from them, all of these MRI findings and how to make the diagnosis. So every patient tells us a story that we learn from to try and help the community. So we really appreciate all of our patients out there. Indeed. Thank you so much, Dr. Flanagan. Thank you to our audience. And we will see you out there. Thanks a lot. Bye.